Thank you for tuning in to RTM Nation Online, where we believe that you will receive the abundance of peace, prosperity, security, stability, health, healing, and truth. If you would like to learn more about the ministry, click the link below. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Now let's get into the message. You know, I was just going over in my spirit over the last couple of weeks that we, we teach here. We're, we're, we're a teaching bunch. And in that, that means that the objective and everything that we talk about is to make your life and the life of everybody else that we are talking to or that are listening to us better. To that end, we cover a lot of details. And those details, and I know I probably go a little bit overboard at times with details, but there's a lot of charts and graphs and many, 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 many scriptures. We cover a lot, a lot of details. So every now and then, we like to pump the brakes and to make sure that we're all on the same page. We want to make sure that we're all in the right position concerning what we've talked about before actually moving forward. Moving forward is a good thing, but it's not good to move forward if we leave family members behind. We want to be that adage that a rising tide lifts all ships. So we want each and every one of us to get to that better place, not just a few of us. That being said, I'm going to pull up my first slide. Here come these details again. Slide number one. Now, you may remember this slide from our first recap. Let's get you up to speed on it. We're not going to take a long time on this one because we want to talk about some further details. But go to my next slide. What did we talk about in our last family recap? We said that each and every one of us have a heart, we have a body, and we have a mind. We know that there's also some discussion. We have a spirit as well. But as far as what we've been talking about, this is what we were addressing because we wanted to make a decision to change. There was obviously some things in your life and in my life that we would want to be better. And that comes with the decision. And without a decision to change, there's never, ever, ever going to be any change. That decision to change was built up on you have to take care of any spiritual strongholds that you have in your life. And you have to have a mindset that has an attitude that says I'm going to change no matter what my circumstances say. Next slide, please. We covered a plethora of messages. Here's a quick recap that we gave last time on some of them. Notice. They deal with the body and they deal with the mind and the heart. That first item in both of those categories is the Holy Spirit. That's an all around help. The Holy Spirit helps us with our body. It helps us. He helps us with our mind. He helps us in our heart. So the Holy Spirit is all around help. But when we focused on our body, we said, listen, you need to know that that body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And because it is the temple of the Holy Spirit, why don't you eat right? Why don't you avoid those controlled substances? Why don't you avoid that physical impurity? Keep your body physically pure. We jumped from the body into the heart and the mind and we said, you know what you got to do? When you're making a decision to change, you got to love yourself. You got to have a confession that says, I love me and I'm going to embrace who I am. I'm going to embrace who I am. I'm going to embrace who God made me. And guess what? I am not going to look into the mirror of society and let that define who I am. I'm not going to be like that fairy tale mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? No, I don't have to look at the mirror of the world. I look at the mirror of the word and that defines who I am. Then we said, by the way, you got to live like you want to win. You got to you got to be in the game. You can't be passive in life. 
By the way, God wants you to win and God expects you to win. And God wants you to get in the game with what you have already in your hands. Don't say I will begin to win in life when. No. We're going to start living like we want to win right now. And to live like we want to win, we cannot succumb in our minds and in our hearts to negative circumstances. We talked about the man in the book of John at the pool of Bethesda, a man that had been waiting for someone to come and put him in the pool. Listen, we're not going to sit around here and wait for somebody to come and do something for us. We're going to get up and do something for ourselves. What other message did we have from that? That man sitting there waiting for somebody to put himself in the pool, we said, don't be like those people that wait too long to ask for help. The type of example I gave is, you know, sometimes you will have a family member that will ask you for some money, for some coin, for some cheddar, and they ask you for a big number when if they had asked you four months ago, it would have been a small number. Why do you ask me when you six months behind in rent? Why do you ask me when you, you know, almost ready to lose the house? Why didn't you ask me when it was a small number? You got to live like you want to win. You got to be mindful of what's going on in your life. You got to handle your business like an adult. Live this life like you want to win. If life is a sport, you want to be the champion. All of that was from our previous family recap. And we've covered a lot of ground since then. Go to my next slide, please. From that time, we asked ourselves a question, what things can we do to really start making change? We drew a line in the sand and we said that it's time to stop talking about making a decision to change and begin taking the necessary steps, steps to experience real change. And what has that been looking like since our last recap? Next slide, please. Here are some of the key items that we've discussed. We're going to hit on all of them and we're going to be going clockwise. Starting from that very first one, change you, change your world. Go to Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1 in the Message Bible. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 in the Message Bible. It'll actually be verses 1 and 2. Thank you for asking. It reads this way. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed, maturity in you. Now go back up to verse 1 there. It starts off by saying, so here's what I want who to do? You to do. And who's helping you? God. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. The very first thing that we are to realize for primary change in your life it is something to be worked out between you and God. 
The first issue to be worked out is not between you and your mama, not between you and your auntie and your cousin, not between you and your neighbor. The first item in your life to be worked out when we're talking about experiencing and real, realizing real change, it is to be worked out between you and God. If we were to go a little further down into that scripture, roll that scripture a little bit more for me, guys. It says, fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out. You will be changed from the inside out. You know, for us to experience lasting change in our life, for us to be what those, what those individuals are that God has called and designed us to be, guess what, family? The change that we make cannot be superficial. The change must be real. We can say it like this. The change to us must truly be a change in us. We have to be changed from the inside out. It can't just be a change for show. It can't just be a change that you slip on like, like a jacket. It can't be a change that we observe when you come to church, but it's not real. So nobody in your household know that you changed. It's got to be a change on the inside because when it's a change on the inside, it doesn't matter where your feet are. The new you is there. You must change from the inside out. And the only way to recognize that change is for you to be bathed in God's spirit and washed by the waters of the word. Of all the things in your world you can consider changing, the best place to start is the change in you. So change you, change your world. It's not the other way around. It's not change your world, change you, but change you, change your world. Yeah, I realize that there may be something, I'm going to say it, sweetheart, I'm talking to a lady, that, sweetheart, yep, it may be something with your husband that you want to change. But the first step is not change him, change your world, it's change you, change your world. There may be some things about your wife fellas that you want to change but the first step is change you change your world there may be something about your child that your children should change about themselves but guess what parent change you change your world it may be something about your boss that should change that irritates you but guess what change you change your world it may be something about your employees that should change business owner but make sure your first step is this change you change your world it's not the other way around it's not change your world change you it's change you change your world if you want to have real change in your life instead of constantly pointing the finger at other people and constantly pointing the finger at what should change outside of you, try putting your energies and your focus on the one who has the characteristics and the traits and the habits directly under your control. And guess what? That one is you. Change you. Change the world. And if you do that, you need to know that as Romans 12 says, we have a God who's ready, willing, and able to develop a well-formed maturity in you. And in developing that well-formed maturity in us, we know that we have the ability to do all things. That well-formed maturity is God flooding us with every aspect of who he is. And the spirit of God working on the inside of us gives us the ability to do anything. And that includes addressing the challenges with our physical bodies. Putting your body in check, though, can be a challenge 
especially if it has enjoyed free reign for a long time. <laughs> Go to Romans chapter 7, the Message Bible, verse 14. It reads this way. I can anticipate the response that is coming. I know that all God's commands are spiritual, but I'm not. Isn't this also your experience? Yes, I'm full of myself after all. I've spent a long time in sin's prison. When your body has spent a long time in sin's prison, it may, be, it may not be so quick to line up with God's order. And we're not talking specifically just about food. I know we touch on food quite often, but we're not talking about just food. We're talking about anything that your body has become accustomed to doing. Its own free will thing for a long period of time. It can be food. It can be substances. Hey, it can be doing nothing. Your body can get accustomed to inactivity. And then getting your body to move it, move it can be very hard. It could be physical pleasures. Once your body has spent a long time in sin's prison, once your body has spent a long time doing what it want to do, it can be a challenge to get that body to now line up with God's will for your life. Same book, Romans, same chapter, chapter 7, verses 9 through 19, 19 through 21, Message Bible, continues this way. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that, it, that it's predictable. No matter what the change is, family, if it takes your body out of its comfort zone, you're going to be faced with a challenge. If your body has become accustomed to doing something over a long period of time, getting it to change is going to be a challenge. Even though it's a challenge, though, yet and still, even though it's a challenge, guess what? We have the ability to overcome it. We just need to continue to declare in our spirit what? Yes, I can. We need to continue to declare and address our bodies straight up with, oh, yes, we can. We can get you to line up with what God wants us to do with you. And if we wanted a scripture to kind of back up that declaration, we said we can go to Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, King James Version. When you get there, very familiar passage, passage of scripture, you'll, you'll know it. It says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. So, yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can take your body to that better place. You can take your body to that better reality. You can take your body to where it needs to go in spite of its resistance. Here's the key, though. The approach to your body cannot be passive. Remember, your body has spent a long time in sin's prison. So you can't approach your body all weak and wimpy. You got to be aggressive. You got to approach your body like you want to win. You got to approach your body, letting it know that, oh, you shall change and stop asking your body if it wants to go to a better place. Tell it that it's going. Don't ask your body if it wants to go. 
Don't su suggest to your body that it might be a good idea to get there. Tell your body that it's going to go, that it's going to go exactly where you need it to be to line up with God's will for your life. And you know what? Tell it we're not eating that anymore. We're not drinking that anymore. We're not smoking that anymore. Tell it we're not going to that place anymore. We're not seeing him anymore. We're not seeing her anymore. Tell your body what it's going to do. Don't make suggestions. Don't give it an option. It's going to a better place, even if you got to drag it, kicking and screaming to get there. Now, family, we didn't leave this little piece out either. You can't tell your body that you're not going to eat that anymore, but you keep buying that. You can't tell your body that you're not going to drink that anymore, but you keep drinking that. You can't tell your body that you're not going to smoke that anymore, but you keep smoking that. You can't tell your body that we're not going to get with him that way no more, but you keep going over to this house to get with him like that. You can't tell your body that you ain't going to get with her like that no more, but you keep going over to her house to get with her like that. Who are you kidding? If you're going to tell your body that it can't do something, you have to show it by what you say and by what you do and by the position you put it in. I'm not taking you there no more. I'm not going to do that no more. And all of my finances, all of my actions are going to line up with you are going to have to bow to what I want you to do. Get that flesh under subjection. Bring it under subjection of the word of God. But by the way, it can't just be all holy and spiritual. You got to let your natural actions line up with it. Stop doing the things that put your body in the position to be the old man. Put that old man to death. Yes, you can. But you got to do everything in your power to make sure that it happens. Go to Genesis chapter 2, King James Version. Now, there are various reasons to take care of your body. And those reasons include, you know, we've already said that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. There's also the reason that, you know, God wants you to take care of yourself. A third reason is poor Bodily management can have a negative impact on what God wants you to do, your purpose. You can't, you can't fulfill your purpose if he wants you to go to missions, but you too ill and broke down and weak to go. Or better yet, you're more than able to go, but to do a mission field, you got to walk it, you know, you got to take a couple steps and you can't get 30 yards without having to take a break. <coughs> it sounds comical, but it's true. The, the, the example we, we used at the time was, how are you going to go out into the mission field and save the world for Christ and you get winded going to your mailbox? Oh. All right, of course, that's the reality that people, next time you take a flight of stairs, you'll know how healthy and, and cardio in shape you are. Just do it sometime. When you catch your breath, you'll know. But of all those reasons, there, there's, there's one very, 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 very practical reason for taking care of your body. Here in Genesis, chapter 2, verse 7, King James, King James Version, it talks about when God is creating man, it says this. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. 
You see, when it comes to our bodies, family, these earthen vessels that we have, the bottom line is we get just one. You weren't born with a spare. I wasn't born with a spare. When the doctor lifted you up and we began to cry, they didn't hold everything so they can get your spare earth suit to come down the path there so that your mama could take it home. You get just the one. And the simple fact that you get just the one should be incentive enough for you and I to take care of the one that we have. Go to Joshua 24, Message Bible. That reason right there was, is really one of the reasons why we spent so much time talking about our physical bodies. Because there's so many things that are in this life that we do. We go to work. We take care of other people. You know, we're, we're taking our children to this kind of practice, coaching this kind of team for whoever. And all the while, we are neglecting that thing we cannot replace, our bodies. We're not eating right. We're not getting the proper amount of sleep. We're putting it under undue stress. On the outside, we look like we're doing well, but so much could be happening on the inside to damage the very vessel that we have but one of. Whether we were talking about our physical bodies or different aspects of our lives. One of the things we made very clear that at some point in time, when we're talking about change, we have to get to a three letter word and that word is now. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, Message Bible reads like this. If you were reading this in the King James Version, it would be where Joshua says, you know, you need to choose who you're going to serve this day. Yeah. If God be God, choose him. Mm -hmm. You know, and so but in the message Bible, it says this. If you decide that it's a bad thing to worship God, then choose a God you'd rather serve. And do it when? Today. And do it today. That takes us to the other part of our graphic. Notice we've gone through change you, change your world. We went through, what was that other one? Yes, yes, you, can. yes you can. Go back. That's where we're going to end up at. Change today. We can talk about change all we want, family. But you know what they say about people that just talk. Talk is cheap. Talk alone don't get you anywhere. You actually have to do something. And when we're talking about change, you have to get to the point to where you're actually doing something now. Doing something today. You have to make the decision. Wake up, stand to your feet and said, I will not be like this tomorrow. I am going to change today. When you say you're going to change today, you must start taking actions and making moves necessary to see that change come to be a reality. Millions of people every single year embark on making a change in their life only to find themselves the following year in that same place and their life have never, has never gotten better. We don't want to beat on people. To say you're going to do something to make your lives better, to have a whole year go by and you look at your list and your list basically says you in the same place you was at last year. We have to break that cycle. We said, we know that we have to eventually start. But our ultimate objective is to actually get to the better place. Not just 
say we're going there. We appreciate the start. But most of all, before we even start dancing about the fact that we're starting, we want to have the resolve to finish. We want to have the resolve to get the job done. We want to have the res resolve to achieve the goal. The word resolve is a core element in the word resolution. What is a resolution? A resolution is a firm decision to do or not do something. And a very critical step to making sure that you are successful in achieving your resolution is to make a strategic plan. Go to Proverbs 24, Message Bible. You know, wise people make plans. Wise people make plans. I know, and I'm, I know I'm going to get a little bit of holy eye looks at this, but many people, especially ch people that go to church all the time, can get to the point to where God's going to give me the instructions. I just need to wait on God. Yeah, you do, and you do, and you do. But that has nothing to do with you planning. You doing your part to do the best that you can do to make sure you are successful in what you think God wants you to do, making a plan for that is not an unspiritual thing. As a matter of fact, Proverbs 24, Message Bible, starting in verse 3, reads this way. It takes wisdom to build a house and understanding to set it on a firm foundation. It takes knowledge to furnish its rooms with fine furniture and beautiful draperies. It's better to be wise than strong. Intelligence outranks muscle any day. Verse 6, strategic planning is the key to warfare. To win, you need a lot of good counsel. I love the word warfare, that warfare there. Because when we're talking about making the necessary change in our life, if you think for one reason that Satan is going to let you take a leisurely stroll into that better life God has for you, don't be surprised if you're mistaken. If you think that the old you, the old man, that body that has been in sin's prison for so long is going to let you just leisurely walk into the new life God has for you, don't be surprised if you are wrong. There's nothing wrong with making a plan. When you're talking about being a finisher, part of being a finisher is to make a strategic plan because you know that there's going to be some conflict. Say this with me. Change, change. invokes, invokes. Conflict. conflict. When you're looking to change your life to be better, when you're looking to change your life to be more godly, you can expect conflict from the enemy. When you decide to tell your body that it's got to put down fried chicken and put up bro pick up broccoli, You ain't never seen an MMA fighter fight like your body going to fight to get that chicken back in your hand to bring it up to your mouth. <laughs> Cauliflower over mac and cheese? What? Your body may just take your hand and slap you for itself. Get thee behind. <laughs>
We're going to elect water in, instead of that. Twelve cup per gallon Kool-Aid. <laughs> We're going to order a salad for our appetizer instead of the spinach cheese dip with sour cream. Change invokes conflict. Why? Because the enemy doesn't want to see you get better and your body has been in sin's prison for so long doing what it wants to do. It's not going to go there just willingly. Sometimes you got to drag it kicking and screaming and a plan is what you need. Put a plan in your arsenal. Yes, we're talking about pre-planning. Now, in other venues, they convey the insightful message about pre-planning this way. You've heard it before. It says this, a failure to plan is a plan to fail. If you decide going into it that you're going to go into it without a plan, you've already put yourself at a disadvantage. If you want to go more spiritual with it, we can go this way. I can guarantee you the enemy got a plan. Your body got a plan. His plan is it ain't going. <laughs> Therefore, to reach your goal, family, we need a plan. But if you're going to have a plan, make sure that plan is smart. Make sure if you're going to have a goal that it's SMART. SMART is an acronym. What does it stand for? Your goal needs to be specific. It needs to be measurable. It needs to be achievable. It needs to be relevant and time bound. That goal that's designed to create a better you, to make a more enjoyable you, that goal designed to give you a better life, more than likely, that goal involves making modifications, changes, adjustments to some well-formed personal habits. Well-formed personal habits. And when you're addressing well-formed personal habits, you have to make sure that your goal is very smart. It has to be complete. When I say complete, I mean that your goal cannot miss or cannot leave out small nuances that can trip you up. What are some of those small nuances? Well, I can tell you one nuance in particular that's very big, but people miss it. It sounds like a paradox, doesn't it? Because a nuance is small, but it's big. It's a small thing, a little detail that people miss, but it has a big impact on how they reach their goal or if they reach their goal. Go to Matthew chapter 12, NIV Bible. I'm not going to put you in suspense. I'm going to tell you what that is. The thing that people often leave off is this. In eliminating a bad habit, it's not good enough to only get rid of the bad habit. When you get rid of the bad habit, you need to replace it with a good habit. Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 NIV Bible begins this way. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house. It finds the house. Hi, how it finds it? It finds it this way. It finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. 
Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked, wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. The Living Bible, instead of saying unoccupied, swept clean and put in order, it says this. It finds, it returns and finds the man's heart clean but empty. When you stop a bad habit, it leaves a void. And it's not good enough to leave that void unoccupied. It's clean, but unoccupied. It's, it's in order, but unoccupied. You have to put a good habit in place of the bad. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. You have to fill that space with good. Don't just leave it a vacant place where bad used to reside. The bottom line in all of our discussions, a theme running through everything that we've been talking about is that we are completion minded. In other words, we are finishers. Say that with me. I am, I am a, finisher. a finisher. We're finishers. And to that end, we made a declaration, and that declaration came from Ecclesiastes chapter 7. In the King James Version, Ecclesiastes 7 verse 8 reads this way. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. The living Bible would say this if you had it in front of you. Finishing is better than starting. Patience is better than pride. So our declaration, and we're going to say this again, but I will, I will read it first. Our declaration was and still is this. Finishing is better than starting because I will be better at the end of the thing than I was at the beginning thereof. Say that with me. Finishing is better than starting. Finishing is better than starting. Because I will be better at the end of the thing than I was at the beginning thereof. Knowing that you're going to be better at the end, knowing that you're going to be better at the finish line, that's motivation to keep you moving forward. But I can tell you, there is something that's even a greater motivator. Nothing motivates you more to getting to the finish line than when you can stand in today Look in your future and actually see yourself at the finish line. You have to be able to stand where you are, look out beyond today and actually see yourself there. Go to Revelation 21, King James Version, starting in verse 1. You have to see yourself there. It reads this way. And I'm just taking a few excerpts out of verse 1 and verse 2. But it reads, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And it goes on to say in verse 2 that it was coming down from God out of heaven. God, God, in this particular scripture, according to John, he saw a vision of new coming from God out of heaven. That needs to be the same way for you and I. We need to be able to stand here today 
and look beyond where we are and see a vision of new. I'm not talking about just imagining it, imagining it. It needs to be so tangible that you can touch it. It needs to be so tangible that it's undeniable. You have to be able to see yourself there. You have to be able to see yourself there. It needs to be to the point to where you're standing in today and you say, I see me. Standing where I am, looking beyond today, having completed my goal, having done well by my resolution, I can see from where I am a stronger me, a wiser me, a bolder me, a healthier me, a happier me. I can see a me that's more faithful. I can see a me that's more committed. I can see a me that's more loving. You have to be able to stand in today and see the new you from where you are. Family, you got to be able to see yourself there. You got to be able to see what you want to be. Say that with me. I got to be able to see what I want to be. You got to be able to see it because you know what? When you are able to see it, can't nobody tell you different. You ever see somebody have a goal for themselves and then somebody come and give them a negative comment and they just break down? They just quit. They give up. Let me tell you something. If I believe God told me to get that bachelor degree, ain't nothing that you're going to say going to turn me away from doing what I got to do to get that degree. Amen. If God told me to get my body in check, ain't nothing you're going to say to me going to change my mind and divert me from doing what I know God told me to, to do. Why? Because in my mind, I don't just see me going to school. I see me on the podium getting my degree. In my mind, I don't see me just where I am right now. I see that body that's more fit. I see that body that's more healthy. If I see my family better in the future, I don't look at where they are right now. I see us happier. I see us spending time together. I see myself in my future. I can see myself where I want to be right now. Amen. Amen. When you have that deep in your spirit, it's hard for you to be moved. You got to see yourself there. Now, y'all know we always have to bring in a little white flag for those of us who may get uber spiritual. <laughs> Every now and then, we want to make sure that we, you know, we wave the flag so we get people in line so we don't have people running off doing just other things than staying in the course that where we're headed. What do you mean, Pastor? Please go to the book of Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4, King James Version, verse 7. As believers, there are times that we can over-spiritualize things. It's, it sometimes comes and it's just, it's just our our nature, I guess. And I don't say that as a negative, in a negative way. I'm just saying sometimes it's just a fact. Sometimes we can over-spiritualize things. We have Proverbs 4, verse 7, King James. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. If you had that in the Living Bible, which is where we took our text from, you would see these words. Getting wisdom is the most important thing you can do. And with your wisdom, develop common sense and good judgment. This in no way, when we're talking about common sense and good judgment, 
minimizes the spiritual. I would never do that. When we're talking about our lives, our lives benefit from every prayer we send up, all the direction we get from God. That seeking direction from God is a core tenet for us as a believer. I will say that there are times in our lives that we look at things as unmovable roadblocks. And those unmovable roadblocks don't need more prayer and fasting to move out of the way. Deliverance can come by the simple application of plain old common sense and good judgment. For common sense and good judgment, we talked about these kind of we talked we talked through these kind of topics. We talked about taking responsibility for your own actions. We talked about understanding when to call someone trustworthy. On, on selecting a trustworthy person, we said that there are times that we get in God's grill, get in his face about the way somebody treated us when we should have never trusted that person from the beginning. We trusted them because of the way we felt. We trusted them because of what somebody else said. We don't trust that way until we see evidence that the person can be trusted. If you had done your research, if I had done my investigation, if I had taken the time to learn about that person for myself, I would have known not to trust them. We said trustworthy described itself in reverse. Why? Because before you call somebody trustworthy, you first have to determine that they are worthy of your trust. We talked about knowing that I'm sorry or an apology is not a cure all. When you hurt somebody's feelings and you break their heart real bad, you likely have to do some damage control. Therefore, it's probably best for you to make the best that you can make the attempt not to hurt their feelings from the beginning. Sometimes things you have to say to people will bring hurt feelings, but just be conscious that when a person is hurt, that there is some healing that needs to come after that. We talked about your posture sets the stage for your environment. Sometimes you'll have, especially in a family atmosphere, you'll have someone talk about there's just not much control, not much order in their household. Well, newsflash, a lot of times your posture sets the stage. If there's no order in the house, somewhere there is a posture of disorder. Once again, change you, change your world. We also talked about you only build relationships with others by engaging them. There are times that we look across the landscape of the people that we feel we're closest to, the people that we love, and we, and we feel like there's a distance between us and we don't realize that we're just not engaging each other. Husband and wife in the same house, but you on this couch on the phone, he got a video game control on his hand, you're in the same space, but you're not together. You have to engage each other if you want to have a relationship with each other. You have to engage your children if you want a relationship with them. You have to engage your friend if you want to keep your friendship. You have to engage. 
So all of this change and action and engagement and common sense and good judgment and everything that we've talked about has to rest on something. Next slide, gentlemen. And where does it rest? On the Bible. The Bible has been or was our most recent session. The book that's more than a book is the core element from all that gives us all the wisdom that deals with all the things that we will continue to talk about and that we've talked about in relation to change. How can I summarize the fundamental message in what we talked about with our Bible? I would say these things. The Bible is a book that's more than a book. The Bible is reliable. The Bible is the truth. The Bible is divine. And as a Christian, it's not good enough for you just to say, I believe the Bible. Family, you must say that I believe the Bible is the word of God. Everything in anything that we teach finds its root, finds its root in the Bible. It always has. And guess what? It always will. So there you have it. We should all be in unison now. Beginning from making a decision to change, going to actually making real change, having gone through another phase of development, following this re recap, the next time we get together, the only thing for us to do is do what? Move forward. Let's pray. We pray that today's message was a blessing to you. If you would like to help us further expand the vision, simply text the word GIVERTM to the number 41444 or visit us online at www.revealingtruth.org. Now remember, Jesus loves you.